starting to record now. Okay, fine. So I can put it up on line. So um, just a few more minutes. Not quite ten past. I had one other thing to do. Okay, I'm not lost. So, um, as I said, I'm talking now. You should be able to hear me. Um, and I'll just wait another second. There's one, two, three. That's good. There's six people. Yeah, that's good. I'll just wait a few more minutes till I should get started. It's not quite ten past, I don't think. Um, So we were actually supposed to be giving an Archer course today, uh, an introduction to Archer course. I had at Harriet Watt, which I don't know if you know is um, southwest Edinburgh, uh, but we had to cancel it because nobody would have been able to get there today and a bit concerned about people. OK, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to first very briefly go over the the solutions to at least the first part of the exercise. So. The idea of the stand, I'll just go through the standalone exercises. The idea of the standalone exercise was I, I, I'll run through through these on my laptop. I, I submitted, I, so I provided you with a template program, which basically was, I called it IO strategy one, but basically all it does is it didn't do anything sensible. It, it read in a data file, the master of rank zero copy down its section of the file and it wrote it out, out again. So give the correct answer on one process, but on four processes, I mean, because they're grayed out here. You know, the other process on the master get no data. The next thing to do was to actually do a broadcast. So now everybody has the data. This is the most naive form of master IO, but then everyone just still copies down the bottom left-hand corner. So everyone will, will, will show the, the bottom left-hand corner of the image. Um, the third strategy, which was correct, but inefficient, whoops, was to, do, was to, to carry out the broadcast strategy but to to, to um, copy down the correct data. And the idea here is just to get you looking at the way the program is set up to make, to make sure you understand how the indexing goes because the processes compute their coordinates. You're going to have to know where somebody is in the grid. So the, 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 all that infrastructure was set up, but you need to, to understand it. The next one was standard master I.O. where you broadcast the data, people copy down their local section and they send it out and that's, that's all fine. Um, but then the two improvements to that were to use data types to avoid the explicit copy. One is using a vector data type where you can use the same vector type, but as a template placed on the array. And the final strategy was to use these new subarrays where you need a new sub, you need a different subarray for each of the of the target of each of the. If you're the the the, the coordinator, each of the workers is going to get a different piece of the data, so you need to to um, you need to send them something um, something different. So what I've done is uh, I'll now basically. I'm going to do a bit of messing around with screen sharing. Hopefully, I'm getting a bit confused here. OK, so what I'll do is I'll, um, I will share the, um, what am I sharing? Uh, so basically, um, bang, I'm in the wrong course here. I will go to the. Um, this course. So this is the code that I distributed, uh, which is where is it? MPIO exercises. So I will uh, MPIO.tar. I'll save it in. I've got, I'm just going to, where is I've put it in temp. I'm just going to play around in this. Um, and if you now look, uh, I've also put in solutions to the master IO exercise. So I will. So this is the the first part that I'll do. So hopefully this is going to work. So now I'll share my. So that's just to, uh, to show you where these are. But now I will um, share a, a um, 
share an application. I will share this and I will try and uh, make it a bit bigger. So hopefully that should be legible. So the idea was just to, first of all, this is what I, I set the MPIO dot tiles just on my laptop. I'll do the CX, I'll do the C versions for the sake of argument, but there's not really any, um, there's not really any difference between these. So um, just to check, can, can people see this? Um, I've got multiple windows up here. It's a bit difficult to see what's going on, but hopefully people should be able to see my, is, is, is my terminal legible? Can you actually, can you see it reasonably clearly? Brilliant. Okay. So, so that's fine. So what I'm going to do is I just type make and um, it compiles a few things. But if I just, if I just run MPI run minus N one dot slash MPI IO, what it does, um, no, oh, I can't type M M MPI run. It basically, what it did is you see is it, 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 it ran on a one process grid. It read in the input file and it wrote, wrote out an output file. And so the input file, now I, I gave you this, the, the reason that the exercise are slightly complicated is and the the MPI, previously for data formats for um, for files, we've used this very naive PGM format, which is a nice text-based format, very easy to understand, and it has lots of information in it. The MPIIO is just pure raw data. So if, if I'm gonna write out an image, it, as an MPI using MPIIO, there are two differences to what we've done previously. First of all, it will be binary data. So you need to have a, I need to give you some program to interpret that. And I've given you a thing called FIO view or CIO view, just to, which just basically can understand the binary data. But also there'll be no header file there. So there's no header on it. And so, so how will the IO program know what size the data file is? Cause it's just raw data. Well, I've kind of, messed about and I've, 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 I've hidden the the size of the file in the name so that's why the input file I'll run it again at the top here the input file is called cinput 0480 by 0216 dot that because it's the input file that's 480 by 216 the output is called c output 0040 by 216 the underscore 00, 00 here means it was written by by, by process 00 because when we're running this in parallel we're going to get multiple outputs because each each process writes its own local output so let's just, if I just do dot slash CIO view, the input file, you'll see that what it is, is it's a bit, I've, I should maybe use a real, this is actually a 480 by 216 picture, but I've actually put in numbers at it. And the reason for doing this, um, actually you can't see this, but um, so maybe I should um, stop for a second. If I maybe share the entire screen, you should see that now. I'm trying to get the, I don't want to share what I'm, so now you should see, uh, if I do that, you'll see that there's that, that's the, that's the output file. Uh, that's the input file. And I, I've, I've put numbers on it, which meant the coordinates. So this is the, the idea is if you get it wrong, you can see which part of the image you're seeing. So seven, five is seven along and five up. It's, it's the, so these are, these are, I just messed, hacked this up. So the idea is that this will allow you to see what's going on. And of course, not surprisingly, the output was the same. Um, whoops, MPI run, uh, sorry, CIO view, C output. It's just the same file, not surprisingly. Then I, what I wanted you to do was to run it on a two by two grid. So I wanted you to, to say X prox is two, Y prox is two. And I re, if I remake, MPI run as N4. You'll see that now I get um, four outputs uh, from each of the processes. And if I look at the uh, the one from the, uh, and they have that they have their size encoded them because they're smaller because it's a smaller section. Um, if I look at the, if, the output from the zeroth process, it is the bottom left-hand corner of the image, as we'd expect. It's a quarter of the image at the bottom left-hand corner. But if I then do it for any of the other ones, for example, process two, I get gray because nothing was sent to them. So I'll just very quickly go through here what the solutions were meant to be for that. So what I've done is I've actually, hopefully, I unpacked 
MPIO masterio.tar. Uh, I've now called them solutions. Now, what's best for me to do is basically um, I can't quite remember how I did this. Okay, fine. So what I want to do is I want to, so the idea is if I uh, copy them to mpio.c. So, 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 so I've got, if you look, I've got one for each uh, language, I've got four solutions. I've got the broadcast solution, the send solution, the subarray solution, and the vector solution. I'm just going to go through them very quickly, but I'm just renaming them. Now I can remake. Now, if I do mpi run minus n4 dot mpio, you'll see that um, what should happen here is that the idea was we broadcast, but we don't do the copy down. So if I do, uh, for example, look at the the output from process two. Uh, oh, okay, so that that is correct. Sorry. So I have done the right copy down. So what you can do if you look at the code, very simple. All we've done, we've got all the stuff we had before, but we basically, I might go around the bottom, we broadcast the data. So we broadcast the data, we broadcast the buffer, which is X by NY floats to everybody, and then we copy down the correct data from buff to X. So basically we have to look at this at this array. That, so, so the P chords array for each rank tells you where you start in the I direction and where you start in the J direction. And so if you you have to, you have to multiply that by the number of processes in each direction to find out um, no NXP is the, sorry, the size in each dimension to find out where you start. It's just a matter of messing around with these and doing a copy. I'm copying into X, which is my local array. I copy the buff. So what I'm doing is that first IO strategy, I broadcast everywhere and, and copy down. Okay. Second, what I wanted to do was um, the S send. I now make and I run again. You'll see that, um, if, that the CIO view takes multiple inputs, so I can do C output star, and it will give me four outputs. Now it puts them in a funny order; it doesn't actually line them up right. But if I line these up, I, I know what order they come out in. Uh, that that actually, you can see if I tile these up, you can see that that's giving me the correct answer. So that worked. Um, so hopefully you can see that. Yeah, I'm getting a bit of, uh, but hopefully you can see that there. And all I did here was exactly all this stuff at the start is the same. Okay, but basically, I now rank zero sends data to the workers in turn using synchronous sends. I did the code in, in I did it in reverse order. So it's just a slight trick that basically what I'm going to do is I can copy the data to my local array and then send it off. But if I do myself last, I don't send to myself. If I have a loop over in reverse order, when I copy to myself, I just don't send it and it sits there. So basically you loop over the, the all the all the, the remote processes. You do the same copy down as you would would, except you copy down the data relevant to the destination process, not yourself. And then you basically only if you're not equal to zero, you do a send. Simple send of MPIS and NX planet, NXP times NYP floats. And then on the other guys you just receive. Okay. So it's a simple. And so if I run this, well you see that we got the right answer. So that was fine. Uh, the next thing which is a bit more interesting is to do it with um, the vectors. Now make, rerun, and we'll, we, get the, we get the correct answer again, except we've eliminated the copy because the copy was only there because we can't do a send of non-contiguous data directly, but it's all the same preamble at the start, but what we do is we can avoid the copy. Here we are. Define the appropriate derived vector type. The pattern the same in all processes, so everyone can make the same call. Um, so in fact, um, we do an MPI type vector, count block length stride data type, and I've called it my MPI vector. And if for the C version, the count is NXP, the block length is NYP, and the stride is NY. That's where I find myself doing these little diagrams. I have to commit it. But the important point here is now I'm looping of the destination processes. 
there is no copy so I have to place the vector at the correct place so I place the vector at the buffer at the I start J start so I still need to work out I start and J start where, where the data comes from but previously I then had to copy it now I don't have to copy it. I just do a send but the important point is I've got a, a what I call a floating type it's this vector which is a pattern and I'm placing it on the buffer rate at the position I start J start and that allows me to use the same vector to send different data to different target processes the final one is the, the fine is really the, the only one that you wouldn't have been able to do after if you fully understood the first semester course if I use the uh, subarray I read uh, looks what needs to be re, re oops you can see my terrible typing I met yes I do want to remake I make it I run it whoops it just does the same stuff let's just guarantee that it works see I overview we get one two not one it's that way around they all tile up correctly um, so that's far oh, wrong way around uh, this one goes here unfortunately they don't which no, I don't get which one they come from and so this is where we actually look at the, the code might be might be useful see what I do now I'm just going to the same place as before is I have to create um, I have to create more than one subarray but for each target process I have a subarray so I actually have an array here of uh, where is it um, I have an array of my subarrays, not one subarray, but I have a little array because so the sizes are always the same, the sub sizes are the same, but the starts change. So remember for the for the for the for the um for the subarray data it's a lot more explicit. You basically just list what the the total size is, the small size is and where it starts. And so I for each size, for each destination, I de I declare where it starts, which is this little bit of maths here. The sub sizes and the sizes are the same. I then create the sub array. It's much simpler. It's end in, which is two sizes, sub sizes, starts, my order C, MPI flow, and I put it in here and I commit it. And that means when I send, the important point is when I send, the send call is the same. So the send call is different for two reasons. Um, just like the vector type, I send one data type. So remember when I did a copy and 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 and, and, and um, a normal synchronous send, a, a basic send, I had to send nxp times nyp data types. I had to send nxp times nyp, which is a lot, lots of reals or floats. Here, the subarray contains all that data, so I just send one of them. But um, I just I don't need to offset into buff. I just pass the address of buff, which is the bottom left hand corner here and the subarray encode the location so I so here the, the arguments that the, the um, buffer is always the same but the but the data type is different in the vector example you had to change the buffer but the, the, the data type was the same so it's worth looking at that because these are exactly the data types we're going to use for MPIO but just before I actually do the lecture the lecture is relatively short but you need to understand and I should maybe I'm getting some very weird effects here. I don't know if anyone's getting them. I'll stop sharing. Uh, no. Stop sharing. Okay. So are there any questions about that? I thought that was worth going through just to give you some um, understanding of how the, the exercise was supposed to build up and, and where the data types came in. But if there's no questions, I'll just go through the lecture, which is relatively short, but you do need to understand um you know the background material to, to to make any sense of it and i'll just just an application where are we uh, so i will now get the right lecture which is um so there's a couple of questions fine okay fine so that's fine people just that's good okay that's good that was clear so basic mpio calls so um, I'll cover the MPIO model, the basic file handling routine, setting the file view, and that turns out to be the most important thing by far and achieving performance. So um, in that solution, we've defined data types appropriate for each process and use them to do multiple sends from the master. 
So that means that you require a buffer to hold the entire file on the master. And this clearly isn't scalable. There's no way you could do this in reality. You know, if you had a huge multi terabyte, petabyte data set, you're not going to be able to, be able to store it on the master. So the MPIO model, um, each process defines the data type for its section of the file. So what happens is each, each of the, process, the target processes just say what, what poor, currently in the, in the master IO model, the master reads in all the data and the master defines the data type for each section which it sends to the, uh, to, to, to the workers. We're gonna turn that around and the, in, in the MPIO model, it's the workers that define what data type they, they're gonna, they define the data type which corresponds to the data they want to read from the file. And this, these are passed into the MPIO routines. That's how you tell MPIO what data you want to read by, by using data types. Data is read and transferred directly to local memory. There's no single large buffer, no explicit master process. So under the hood, MPIO might be implementing a master model, but, it prob but you hope it doesn't. That would be very inefficient. So um, it's the model. So there's four stages. We open the file, we set the file view, we read or write the data and close the file. All the complexities in the file um, I mean, any I.O. systems can allow you to open, read or write and close, but it's this file view which is important. Now, in practice, um, write is probably more important in practice than read because it's harder to do because you have this problem with, with overlapping processes, opening multiple processes, opening the same file. Uh, and as I mentioned in the lecture on Monday, most large scale parallel programs write an order of magnitude more data than they read. But for the, for the purposes of this example, I'm doing I'm doing read. So to open a file, you basically call MPI file open. Um, you, you specify communicator, so it's, it's collective across a communicator, and the fact that it's collective will be very important for performance. You give a file name and access mode, an info object, and a file handle. So basically, it's the same in, in, in Fortran. It attaches a file to the file handle. So this is just like doing any file open in C, FP equals F open of file name read. It's not a big deal. Uh, the Routines collected across the communicator. Uh, the access mode is specified in this in this A mode vet variable, and the common ones are MPI mode create, MPI mode read only, MPI mode write only, MPI mode read write. So if you're only going to read a file, you should open it with access mode read only. Um, but this is just a little flag. So um, you know the only this is just like any file open routine except it has a communicator. I'll come back to the info object later. The info is the way you pass hints to MPI IO. We won't really use it in this. Um, in this lecture course because actually there's better ways of doing it than that but MPIO allows you to hint to give extra information to the IO library examples you declare a file hand MPI file file handle the access mode is MPI mode read only we MPI file open MPI com world everyone's op opening it data.in access mode MPI info null and you get a file handle back and if you don't want to specify any additional information you just pass MPI info null that says and in Fortran it's exactly the same um, if you want to create the file as well as write there's a slight quirk that if you want to create and write a file which is what you normally want to do you have to specify the union of mode create and mode write only so for example in C you do int access mode is MPI mode create logical or MPI mode write only or in Fortran you can just add them together um, so that's the only slight quirk um, that um, that if you if you open a file for write and it doesn't exist, it will fail. You have to actually say, which isn't the normal behavior for IO libraries. They normally think if you open a file for write and it doesn't exist, well, well, I'll create it. That's not true here. You have to explicitly say you want to create it as well as maybe write it. Closing a file, MPI file close, no big deal. It's collected across the communicator. It must be called by all processes in that communicator. No surprises there. Even the read routine is quite simple. So you do MPI, so we'll come back to, but this is a collective routine. MPI file read all means that everybody in the communicator is, um, is um, calling the read function. Now you may notice that this is a strange MPI routine because there is no communicator in here. But the communicator is stored, when you open a file, you open it collectively across the communicator. So MPI IO knows which communicator you're talking about because it, it, that information is stored in the file handle. So for MPI IO routines, they're a little unusual. They don't take communicator arguments. They know what communicator they're working from because it's stored in the file handle. So, so that's um, so it's like uh, MPI file read all is like a receive. You're ex everybody's executing a receive, except you're receiving from the file, not from. A so you're saying I want MPI file read all is a bit like saying 
I want to do a receive, but you're doing a read. I want to receive from the file. Buff count data type status is just the same as doing a receive, except you're not receiving a reading from the file. It reads count objects of type data type from the file on each process, collective across a communicator. It's like CF read or Fortown read. Um, now, if you look at this routine, we haven't specified any offsets into the file. Okay, we have. We've just said everybody, everybody, everybody read um, read from the file. We don't have, we don't have any offsets at all. So processes don't all read the same data. Why? Well we do something called setting a file view. So this is the really critical point about MPIO is when you set the file view. Uh, so I'm not going to cover right here, but the, the right syntax is the same. MPI file right order is exactly the same. So if you look at this, if you look at this, um, arg uh, look at this function, you might say, okay, that looks fine, but how do I make sure that each um, process reads different data? Because there's nothing in that function prototype to indicate that. In between, I'll go back to the first slide. In between opening a file and reading or writing data, you have to do something called setting the file view. And this is the absolutely critical point about MPIO. So MPI file set view, is, it's rather complicated, but what, it will, what it, all it's doing is it's saying, during the following IO routine, I want, to, I want to only access these parts of the file. So if, you know, so that allows you, it's like you're specifying a template. You're saying, okay, each process says, I'm interested in this part of the file. I'm interested in that part of the file. And that's called the file view. So you do MPI file set view. You specify a file handle. You specify a displacement. And I'll come back to, to what that, that's, that's saying, where in the file do I want to start? OK, so you're saying, here's a file. Where in the file do I want to start? So you can immediately see that if each process sets a different file view by specifying a different displacement, they could all start at a different point in the file and, um, and then read different data. However, that's probably not the most elegant thing to do. You specify data type for the E type, the elementary type. You specify data type for the file type. You specify data representation and you specify an info object. I'll come back to all of these. But this specifies the starting point in the file in bytes. This is why it's rather horrible um, because um, it turns out that's in bytes and that just is a bit of a nasty thing to calculate. E type specifies the elementary data type, which, which is the building block of the file. So basically, for our, for our example, E type would be MPI file, uh, MPI floater, MPI double. Uh, no, sorry, MPI floater, MPI real. Uh, data rep specifies the format of the data in the file. We'll talk about that later. Info is a hint, hint, system specific hints. We'll just use MPI info null. But the file type is the absolutely crucial thing here. The file type is an MPI data type, which tells the the I/O library which portion of the file you are interested in. So for example, if you want to read the top right hand corner of this big data file, you have to specify a data type, which is that top right hand corner. You specify it as the file type, and that's how you communicate that information to MPIIO. So file views, once set, the process only sees the data in the file. So what happens here, let's have, this is, imagine, we've, remember, this is our classic example, a canonical example, a four by four array stored across a two by two um, grid of processes, where globally the, 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 the array values are, I've, I'm assuming that they're, they're uh, contiguous going up the way, it doesn't really matter, but they're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So the file contains those numbers in order, but for example, the gray process, which is rank one, I want it to read elements three, four, seven, and eight. Now, how we did that previously is the master took those data elements explicitly, either by copying or specifying some data type and sent them. We're not going to do that here. What happens is this rank one specifies this data type as the file type. And that, so if I specify, if rank one specifies this as the file type, block, gap, gap, element, element, gap, gap, element, element, which is this guy, gap, gap, element, element, gap, gap, element, element. This is a mask on the file. So rank one is saying, once you specify a file type, you don't, that is all you see of the file. So once rank one has said, this is my file type, it only sees elements three, four, seven, and eight. It's a mask, everything else is forgotten, okay? So you, you, you've, you've, you've picked out a window of the file. And that's why, MPIO is quite simple at the read stage. Once you've done that, 
If rank one wants to read these four elements, it just says, I want to read four reels, please. And the fact it gets these, three, four, seven, eight, is because the file type has already been applied to the file as, as a mask, a template. Put And, and that all, once you've done a, a, a file view, all you see is it's as if you had a, your own personal file which only contained this data. So having applied this as the file type, you can then do linear reads, the holes in the data type is skipped over. That's why the read is very simple. You just see I want to read four floats, four reels, and you get three, four, seven, and eight because you previously were more sophisticated in specifying a file type, which is an MPI data type, to only point to those, those data entries. So that's the MPI model. You open a file, you set the file type, which is the crucial part. You say, this is all the data I'm interested in. Forget everything else. Once you've done that, you can just do a read and you get the right data. Okay. So the file type should tile the file. So this means if so if I want everyone to read the correct data, rank zero needs this file type, one, two, five, six. Rank one, as we've seen, needs three, four, seven, and eight. Rank uh, two needs 9, 10, 13, and 14, and rank 3 needs 11, 12, 15, 16. And if we add them all together, they tile the file. So if everyone just says, I want to read four, four entries, the red guy will get this one, this one, and this one, and we will read all the file in into the correct place. A couple of the data representation I haven't talked about. It's a string. It can be native, internal, or external 32. You should, you should use native. Raw bytes are written to the file exactly as in memory. There is a portable version called external 32, which should be portable by to any platform. But, you know, IO is slow. So really, we don't want to slow anything down. We just want to use the native representation, which says when you write the data to file, just dump the bytes as they are in memory. Don't do any conversion or anything trendy like that. OK, if we wanted to transfer this file to another system, we might write it out in this external 32 format and then read it in again. But, you know, for the six months or a year you're running on the same platform and you want fast IO. So I would specify, I, I would recommend doing native. There is some internal middle ground called there is some middle ground called internal where the portability depends on the implementation. I think the idea here is that this is portable between, for example, all versions of open MPI or all versions of MPI CH2, but not between the two. But it's really a useless one. I would say for speed use native, if you want to transfer the file to a different machine, use external 32, but I would always say use native. So, how are we going to specify, the, for example, the green process, rank 2, gets elements 9, 10, 13, and 14? If we do it with a vector type, okay, we need to place the vector type at some point in the file, okay? And we do that in MPIO by specifying a displacement. So if we wanted to use vector types, we need to somehow remember a vector type. The vector type is the same. It's just it's entry, entry, gap, gap, entry, entry. So rank zero, rank one, rank two, and rank three. If they specify this pattern as a vector type, they'll all specify the same vector type. Okay, uh, count equals two, block length equals two, stride equals four. However, how do we get them to read different data? The only way we can do it with vector types is when they when they set the file view, they have to specify a displacement which is appropriate. So rank zero would specify zero displacement. Rank one would specify, well, it would have to be eight bytes here, two times four bytes. Rank two would specify a displacement of, what is it, 16 bytes. And rank three would specify a displacement of um, uh, 40. Um, sorry, rank two would specify a displacement of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 32 bytes. And rank three would specify a displacement of 40 bytes. So we can do that, The simple, but, um, that's rather ugly because you have to do lots of jiggery poetry to work out what displacement is. I think the simplest approach is set disp equals zero and use specify the offset of the files using fixed data types. In other words, when these processes specify their file view, they should they should specify it not with a vector type, which doesn't have the leading gap, but with a um a subarray type, which encodes the position and the shape. And so once you've done that, you, do, you don't have to bother about this horrible byte displacement. You can say, look, start counting from the start of the file. Displacement is zero. Rank three reads the right data because its data type, which is a subarray, already encodes this leading gap. So um, the only slight technicality is in Fortran, a classic bug is to specify a hard zero there. You can't specify a hard zero because this is a byte displacement which might be more than um, four gigabytes, which is 
two to the 32. So it, it's a funny, it, it has to be a, an eight byte variable. So in, in, in Fortran, it's of type MPI offset kind. So, so in C, the way function prototypes work, you can put a zero in there. If you're a Fortran program, a disk, you can't just put a zero in there. It has to be a 64 bit zero. And, and the correct way to do that is to do integer kind equals MPI offset kind disk equals zero. Call MPI file set view file handle displacement. So I would recommend setting the view with fixed data types and using zero displacements. And I think that, so that so fixed data type here means a subarray. You could use a, what, and this is my fixed and floating data types in my terminology, but I think of a vector data type as floating because it's a template which you place. You could use floating types in the view, but when you, when you set the file view, you have to have a, a non-zero displacement. So displacement is special in bytes, so we need to know the size of the E type. The, the elementary type, which here is a which is here is a real number, which is four bytes, but the files are linear one D arrays, so we need to do a calculation. So we'd have to do something on the, the displacement is i times n y plus j, all times the size of a float, or it's all horrible. Okay, so using vector types and, and explicit displacement is one of the exercises, but um, but uh, it, it is much. Um, um, simpler if you use subarray types. The E type is normally something like MPI real or MPI float. Um, the data type is normally the same as the E type, but you can play some useful tricks, and, and we'll, I'll talk about those later. So that is the way that you would. Oops. Um, you should do the exercise. Ah, oh, sorry. I have. I'm messing around a bit. Sorry. I have messed this up a bit. Sorry, I'm just being a bit stupid. Okay, but I'm missing a slide, but I know it is. Apologies. So was there a question there? So I thought I heard there was a no. Um, so sorry, I'm 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 messing this up a bit. I will. So you would do set the file view with the file handle you'd opened. The displacement was zero. The date, the E type is something like MPI float or MPI real. The file type is this subarray, which is each rank specifies differently depending on its position. Um, the data is native and the info can just be MPI or info null. So collective IO um, for read and write underscore all is collective. All processes attached to the file are taking part. Now other IO routines do exist where you just delete the all. You can do MPI file read or MPI file write. However, the functionality is the same, but the performance will be slower. And this is the absolute critical thing about MPI IO. If you do an MPI file IO read all or write all, okay, the IO library knows the yellow process has specified this file type, the blue process that file type, the gray process that file type, and the red process that file type. It can be clever. It can say, well, actually, look, if I combine the data from the yellow and the gray process together, I get this nice big block of data and I can write that all out at once. And I can do with the red and the blue process. And so because you're doing MPFI write all, it knows everyone's writing, it can do very clever things to do with aggregating data together. If you delete the all, you will get the same answer. You will get the same answer on file, but it will be much, much slower because it will have to write this data. And as I mentioned at the lecture, it will have to open the file. It will have to probably have to lock the file to say, look, I'm, I'm messing around with this file bit by bit no one else use it it will write these two elements skip write these two elements skip it's just a nightmare and so the difference between using mpi file read write all and mpi file read write for even relatively simple data patterns can be factors of a hundred or a thousand and i'll go on to some performance numbers in the final lecture but really the way to get performance out of mpi io is to use collective io which is use the read all and write all versions because that's the that is when MPI can be clever, the IO library can be clever and, 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 and you know, decide when and how it writes out data. If you, have the, if you don't have the all, you're saying, look, I want you to write this out data, right? you have to write it out now, and it can't do anything clever. If you have the all in there, then it can do very clever things. Info objects, you can pass optimization hints to MPI IO, and these are things to do with uh, buffer sizes, blocking factors, number of IO nodes. It's all a bit complicated. However, if you want to, there are routines to create an, create an info object, set it, and free it. They're kind of, um, they're key value pairs. However, my 
the way I want you to do the exercises is to actually, if you want to manipulate the file system, if you want to tell MPI, use, I want you to store this file across four disks or 16 disks or one disk. Rather than specifying that through the info object, it's better to specify it at the file system level. So it's actually better on Archer, which is the Luster file system, to basically, you can, you can say, when you create a directory, you can say, every file in this directory should be striped across four or 16 disks. And it just turns out to be better to do it at that level, not not in the MPI. So I, I would recommend said it using MPI info and null and do all the clever stuff externally. So summary, MPIO calls it deceptively simple. You open the file, you read and write, and you close. But in between the open and the read and write, there's this critical file view phase. The user must define appropriate file types of so file view is correct on each process. This is the difficult part. But having done that, you can use collective calls whenever you can. And now the IO library has a global view. It knows what everyone is doing. It knows what portions of the file they're accessing. It knows that everyone's doing it at the same time. It can do um, collective calls. And it, rather than doing thousands of small IO operations, it can do a very small number of large IO operations. And I've got some performance figures for the final talk, but the differences can be factors of hundreds or thousands. So I realized that the, the lecture, I haven't. I wanted to briefly show you whether there's one, it's just hints for doing the exercise. Um, I just wanted to show you, it should be in the exercise, whoops. In this. So to use MPIO, Past you, 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 it turns out the derived types that we've created for the master master IO are the same derived types you want um, in the in the MPIO. In the master IO, they are derived types which pick out the correct portions of data from the entire data set which is stored on, on rank zero. In MPIO, they're used for each 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 MPI process to say which part of the file it needs, but they, they are the same data types. You can use subarrays with disp equals zero or a vector with non-zero values of disp. And the, and, and the, the template is for Fortran. To find the subarray data type for this process, you set the disp equals zero, but you have to do it into kind equals MPI, and then you do call MPI file open, then call MPI file set view, file handle disp, which is zero, MPI real is the E type. You specify the subarray, this is the thing you have to get right, native MPI info null error. And then you use MPI file read all file handle buff count MPI real, where count is the number of reels you want to read, and buff is the uh, buff is the target where it's going, and file handle is the file, and then you close it. Or in Fortran, it's just this, in C, it's just the same, except you'd have to do this, because the prototypes exist, you'd have to worry about this 32-bit, 64-bit integer stuff, so it's exactly the same. So the important point is you have to define the subarray correctly to do that. So um, that's a bit of a, a run through, a bit of a, a whiz through, but but I think you know it's. I think the most important thing to understand is this slide here. As I say, no, sorry, this slide here, the file view is a mask onto the onto the file. Once you set the file view, that is all of the file you see. So typically you're masking out 90%. You know, if you're running on a thousand processes, you'll be masking out 99.9% .9 of the file. You just say, and then once you've done that, you can do a linear read. Just say, read four reels, please. And it reads three, four, seven, eight, because the file type has masked out everything else. So the read is very simple in MPI. I would say, I want to read 100 integers. But where they come from, which is which could be an arbitrarily scattered pattern, and we've seen that even for very simple I.O. patterns like this, two by four by four array on a two by two grid, we get surprisingly complicated scattering. Um, you read the right data because the, the file type is setting you with a file type, which does that. that. That's really the most important point. So um, I didn't know if there were any, I'll now, I'll stop sharing for the moment. I, I, don't, I don't see quite the same view as you, but when I stop sharing, does my, I think my face looms, does, does it zoom in on the camera? 
I don't I don't see that. I, I just see you guys, but is there a big view of me now on the screen? Yeah, fine. Okay. So does anyone have any questions? I said that the recording will go up online. Um I'll link it in. I'll probably put it on um I'll probably put it on to um YouTube. So Linda, it depends on the mode. Okay, okay you do you mean you can decide to track speaker or track whatever. Yeah, I get a slightly as presenter, I get a slightly different view. Yeah, okay, fine. I said, does anyone have any questions at all? So, well, okay, I so said the, the, the lecture's up there, the template solutions for the first part of the exercise are up there, which is worth looking at, which will show you how to define the direct data types. And that then, if you understand that, it's quite a simple progression over to the, um, so just to show, show you that the the, um, the exercises do actually work. If I um, maybe just do a share again, my share application entire screen. So if I just go back to, um, hopefully this will work. I deliberately did very small. Ex uh, whoops. I'm having, I'm, I have to move my own window off, otherwise I see myself an infinite number of times. You should be able to see that. Yeah, you can see that. If I just, um, I wanted to do, for example, a four by four array, that should work. If I do the MPI run, it should complain. Yep, uh, compile for 16, so now I'm running on 16. And what you see is you get loads and loads and loads of output because if I, because of course we now have 16 processes all creating their output. So if you look, I get lots of files, but maybe, will this cope? Maybe I don't have my C output 0120 start. Uh, it puts them all in, where are they? Oh, it's putting them all in weird places. Okay. Uh, ah, I did the wrong thing there. Sorry. I was not on the ball. 0120. I should get 16 files here. Yeah. It's going to be more than my... Okay, so if I had the stamina, I could arrange these into... I could tile these up into... The idea is that if I... Yeah, oh, this is, I'm surprised my laptop can cope. Okay, I'm going to get 16 of these guys. They're all over the place. Um, but if I arrange these correctly, but you can see they've all got what you'd expect. They've all got, uh, remember it's the, it's a four by four grid of processes, but it's, um, if you remember the number array is eight by six. So, so, so each, that's why these are slightly truncated. So this one here would go, this, this goes on top of there. So you think, yeah, we are 61. So that's quite cool. Okay. So if I had enough time, I could re carefully arrange all these to, to, to reproduce the, um, um, Where's seven? It's quite therapeutic, actually. Seventy-three. That one. That one's gonna go there. Yeah. Okay. I don't quite have the stamina, but you, I hope you get the you get the idea. So I'll stop sharing now. Are you getting got a weird? Am I sharing the screen, which is sharing the screen, which is sharing the screen, and getting weird things going off into infinity? It's quite quite wacky. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop that before we all in case we have any people who are, don't like flashing lights, what I'm gonna have to, how do I do stop? I have to stop there. There we go, that's better. So, okay, that, that I'm bang on time. I hope that was um, that was useful to you. Uh, and I'll see you guys again um, on Monday, where I'll give a final lecture, which talks about, about performance and, and, and two things, A, how you get performance from MPIO, and B, how MPIO relates to other IO libraries, which are actually more, becoming more used in practice, they're more flexible and more general purpose. They're called HDF5 and NetCDF. However, um, I think HDF5 is hierarchical data format version 5 and NetCDF is uh, um, 
C, um, I don't know what, I don't know what C stands for, but something data format. Um, but um, I'll tell you how these relate to MPIO. Um, and okay, well, I hope you've all survived in the weather and I'll see you guys. Uh, the lectures are on tomorrow. I think you, you've, you, you may have had, you should have had emails saying that various lectures are on tomorrow. Um, so the, the university advice is, I mean, for staff, I couldn't see the university advice for students. Maybe you get it via my, my ad. The university advice for staff is the university is open. And so you're advised to go to work if it's safe for you to travel. So, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't travel if it's not safe. But if you're traveling from the central area tomorrow, if you live in Edinburgh, you need to get to another part of Edinburgh. I, I'm expecting that, the, you know, things like bus transport stuff will be fine. So, um, but if you know if you have more complicated travel arrangements, then you know, don't tra only travel if it's safe. But the university will be open, and I believe most of the MSc lectures are going ahead. Okay, I'll log off now, and um, as I said, see you guys again on Monday. Bye.